All right. Hey, uh, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are, everybody. Hello. Uh, my name is William Murphy. I'm the project director for the TAP in Innovation Network. And welcome to today's webinar, Telehealth and HIV after COVID-19. Our panel discussion is going to focus on what we have learned in the uh, pandemic to date and what we hope to sustain moving forward as, um, as we hopefully move on in the future from the, the current pandemic conditions. Um, this is the latest in a series of webinars that we've produced for jurisdictions that have received ending the HIV epidemic funding. And uh, we want to thank our funder, HRSA, HIV AIDS Bureau, for their support and for the support of the 47 EHE jurisdictions. Our purpose as the technical assistance provider is to promote cross-jurisdictional learning and ensure that jurisdictions have access to the work, the resources that they need. Today's webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes, but we're aiming for a 75 to 80 minute uh, panel uh, discussion, um, and then we'll allow time for uh, question and answers, and hopefully we'll be ending before the 90 minutes to give you a bio break before your next Zoom meeting. We are uh, the EHE funded uh, technical assistance provider, as I mentioned, for EHE um, jurisdictions. And given the national reach of our mandate, we've assembled key partners and expert faculty who together bring expertise on a broad range of interventions and topics. And this array of geographic and subject matter expertise allows TAPIN the flexibility to call on those experts in the analysis of plans on the development of uh, TA plans and delivery of focused technical support. Jurisdictions can request TA at the uh, email box above in that green bar. And we'll run that again toward the end of uh, today's webinar. And TAPIN has developed a national TA strategy that's designed to strengthen and support implementation of jurisdictions EHE plans that will meaningfully contribute to the nation's effort to reduce new HIV infections by 75% by 2025 and 90% by 2030. That's an ambitious goal, and we know that our response needs to be equally ambitious. Next slide, please. So once again, thank you to our funder, HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau and the uh, Department of Health and um, Human Services. Um, this is our slide about our funding. And now I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Tom Donahue, Hope, Professor uh, at UCLA's Department of Family Medicine. Tom? Hi, thanks, Will. Good morning. Well, good morning if you're on the West Coast like I am, and uh, good afternoon to all the people on the East Coast. If I could get the next slide. As Will said, I'm Tom Donahoe. I'm faculty in family medicine uh, here at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, where the Department of Family Medicine is the principal partner for TAPIN. I'm going to be reviewing the agenda. So we're gonna uh, start with an introduction through a brief case, and we're gonna have a, a series of polling questions, the first related to that case and subsequent ones about who you are. Then I'm gonna do just with three slides, a very brief recap of what are some telehealth basics. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this because we really wanna get to the panel discussion. Then Will is going to review the EHE jurisdictional plans and which ones included um, telehealth related activities. And then we're gonna importantly have our panel discussion, which is really gonna look at sort of how did we get to where we are right now with telehealth services uh, largely in reaction to COVID and where are we gonna be in the future after COVID-19, hopefully benefiting from some of that um, introduction by uh, FIRE to telehealth services for many clinics. And so we want you to think of you uh, yourself as a participant, not just for the Q&A section at the end, where we're also gonna ask you about future training needs through a poll, but throughout today's discussion. So please do you use the Q&A feature and um, some of those we might be able to answer in real time and then we'll um, be answering them through the panel discussion as well. Next slide.
so these are the objectives for today. Uh, by the end of the session, you'll be able to explain challenges and facilitators of implementing or enhancing your existing uh, HIV telehealth program. You'll be able to consider how implementing or enhancing HIV telehealth can help meet the EHE goals within your jurisdiction or your program. You'll be able to identify one to two innovative strategies for addressing health disparities through HIV telehealth. And you'll be able to describe how to request, importantly, training and technical assistance from TAPN to measure and improve existing and proposed HIV telehealth services within your jurisdiction or your program. Next slide. So today is really a webinar that's more conversation than 25 slides and, and best practices. So we really want to have a conversation with the panel and with you all who are participating about how COVID-19 spurred rapid changes in HIV services in 2020. Programs across the nation had to very quickly ramp up telehealth services in order to maintain HIV continuity of care. I often say to myself, if HRSA had funded every single HIV program with an additional 5% to their budget, it, they would have gotten less than what we've all gone through with COVID. I mean, there's been so much training and movement and development of skills just through our response to COVID-19. So what are agencies doing? What do they need to do in the future to maintain telehealth and adjust in a post-COVID world? And importantly, a theme that we hope is threaded, out, th threaded throughout the entire webinar is how can you or the programs you work with request uh, technical assistance and training from TAPIN? Don't do this on your own. We're gonna give you a lot of resources, but make sure to use us as a resource as you explore these issues. Next slide. So let's start with the case. So Friends HIV Clinic or FHC did not offer telehealth appointments before COVID-19, but quickly transitioned to telehealth to about 80% of telephone appointments by April of 2020. So most of FHC's patients liked these telephone appointments. They felt it kept them safe from COVID and they didn't have to spend half of a day completing an in-person visit. By summer of 2020, or in summer of 2020, FHC received funding to begin video appointments with the expectation that in a post-COVID environment, they would be seeing patients in person and via these new video appointments. However, in a recent survey of their patients, many voiced concerns that they would struggle to make these video appointments because of concerns they had about the technology or potentially having to use their limited phone data that may occur charges. So, Think about what kind of um, TA, next slide, which is a polling question, friends, HIV clinic may need. So in your opinion, what do you see is FHC's number one telehealth related technical assistance need in the coming year? Uh, is it transitioning patients from phone to new video format appointments? Is it transitioning patients uh, from these phone appointments back to in person? Is it transitioning providers and staff from phone to video? Is it transitioning providers and staff from telephone back to in-person? Or do you think they've got uh, another number one technical assistance telehealth related uh, need? So go ahead and give us your opinion. <clears throat> we'll give you about 10 seconds to vote. And if we could go ahead and close and broadcast the results of that. Okay, so the number one response at 44% was transitioning patients from phone to video. And I think our panel largely agrees with you when we were talking about it, but still a significant, the number two response, 19% was, was uh, transitioning the providers and the staff from phone to video. I think people can share some of their experiences um, in our panel as well for that. And then sort of a tie between um, transitioning patients uh, from phone to in-person or providers and staff from phone to in-person, but 15% of you said other telehealth uh, related needs. Uh, does anybody wanna put something in the, the chat that you were thinking about that? And we'll look for that as we, as we move on. So let's go to the next polling question. So we want to find out a little more about the people who are participating in today's webinar by starting with where, where are you located? So what part are you um, in the good morning section or the good afternoon section of the country? So find your state here, 
and go ahead and indicate what part of the country you're in. We'll give you a few more seconds. And so I see we do have a comment on the previous question that they're gonna need TA on um, how to help clients get phones. Um, another person said, um, I chose other because I think there could be a hybrid option that combines both in-person and telehealth. I think that's a really good point. So let's go ahead and close this and see where we have our participants today. Okay, that's great. There, you're all over. We've got a lot of people here in the, in the Pacific. So we'll, good morning to you. Um, then region four is next and it looks like region three. So to everybody, welcome. And we'll go to the next polling question. Okay, so what best describes your number one HIV related work role? I know we often have many hats, but what's your number one HIV related work role? Um, is it with the health department? Are you part of a Ryan White Planning Council? Are you primarily a clinician, case manager, linkage person, navigator, social worker, administrator? Are you with the federal government, with HRSA, for example? Are you have some other role? And if you do click other, go ahead and write in the chat. And let's go ahead and close that and broadcast the results. Okay, great. We have a lot of case managers and we've got health departments. So that's a perfect combination for us about who will be helping to think about telehealth services in the future. Um, we have 10% uh, are clinicians. That's great. Couple, uh, One linkage navigator, 10% uh, social workers, 12% administrators. This is kind of the perfect mix of people who might be re requesting TA for telehealth after COVID-19. So can we go to the next polling question? So I'm gonna ask you the next uh, three or four questions are thinking about what is currently going on in your jurisdiction, clinic or program, and then we're gonna think about um, where it's going. So how is your agency or agencies in your jurisdiction? How are they currently de delivering HIV services? Is it primarily through in-person appointments, primarily through phone appointments, primarily through video appointments? Uh, is some other way that they're handling it currently? You can go ahead and put it in the chat or your agency doesn't really deliver services so you can't even guess. So go ahead and just take your best response there. And I see we have a telemedicine advisor with us. So that's great. I hope you ask a lot of questions. So let's go ahead and close this and see what people said. Okay, so it looks like we've moved at least uh, for the people who are on the call today to where the number one response is primarily through in-person appointments. I can say with the HIV programs that I work with locally, I, I don't think they're quite there yet. Uh, they would be the number two response, which is primarily through phone appointments. You can see we only have three people or 7% saying um, primarily through video appointments. And um, there was nobody who didn't guess. Thank you for that. And uh, we had about 14% who don't provide HIV services. So this is sort of the mix we were thinking we would see. And then let's go to our next question around the same topic. So go ahead and think of after COVID-19. So after we're you know, we're pretty much done with COVID-19. I just put here 2022. Uh, think about people are no longer wearing masks, hopefully. Um, how do you think your agency or agencies in your jurisdiction will be delivering HIV services after COVID-19? So primarily through in-person appointments, primarily through phone appointments because people like them, primarily through video appointments because those people like them, I can't guess or we don't deliver services. So go ahead and take a quick um, indication of your feelings and we'll close that. And go ahead and broadcast the results. Okay, so there's a, a guess that there's gonna be a big jump back to in-person appointments, but we still have a few people who say primarily through phone appointments or video appointments. And I think there's gonna be some panelists 
who may agree with you because there are a lot of people who are enjoying the ease of phone appointments, for example, but I think we will largely go back to in-person. Next slide, but hopefully we're gonna benefit from what we're learning about telehealth right now. So one last question about this. So um, when you think about uh, the changes from pre-COVID to post-COVID and what we're gonna see after COVID, do you think that um, you know, there, there might be a decrease even comparing before COVID to after COVID that patients will even more than ever before want to be seen in person? Do you think there will be a slight increase um, of people using telehealth given the positive experiences they're having right now? Or do you think there'll be a major increase? And that means more than 20% of people, for example, who want to continue using telehealth um, because they found it more convenient or you just find it too hard to estimate. So go ahead and take your best um, expression of what you think. And we'll go ahead and, and close that. And I can see in the chat, somebody said uh, video appointments are difficult for many clients who don't have access to the technology to make it possible. And so 84% um, of people see an increase. So 54% see there's going to be a, a slight increase and 30% uh, say a major increase because of the positive experiences that people are having, which we'll talk about in a second, because of their transition to telehealth. So thanks so much for that. And that's useful, I think, for our panelists to think about the, the discussion topics we have today. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to spend about three minutes and three slides just to review uh, telehealth basics. A lot of this come from the resource uh, sheet that we're sharing with you that we hope we can partner with you to use if, when you request TA. And then um, much of this comes from the Ryan White meeting, the last uh, Ryan White meeting, which was done virtually. Next slide, please. So like I said, in a minute or so, we know the definition of telehealth is um, providing healthcare remotely via telecommunications. There's many different formats for telehealth. and. In the very last polling question at the end of the webinar, we're going to ask you um, what you would like to get in maybe a next focused webinar in terms of different formats to, to focus on. I mean, it can even be apps that people are using, and I know some of those were proposed in jurisdictional plans. It can um, be uh, the direction of the patient to provider or provider to patient, and it can be used to do just about anything to assess, diagnose, manage medications, etc. And so telehealth um, was used by many HIV clinics before COVID-19, but really every clinic had to transition to some form of telehealth in response to COVID-19. Next slide. So what are some of the potential benefits of telehealth? So we primarily looked at the Ryan White sessions themselves just to focus on the Ryan White clinic environment. And so some of the benefits that people expressed were being able to maintain continuity of care during the COVID-19 restrictions, um, that there was actually good access for those with distance or disability barriers. It tended to be more convenient and flexible in terms of both the provider and patient schedules. Um, some people expressed that there was reduced stigma uh, and confidentiality concerns of visiting an HIV clinic. It could potentially address health disparities if, if someone has transportation issues or um, it could ease their access getting to clinic. And as the person just mentioned in the chat though, that it could also increase barriers if someone has a hard time accessing video and that's the only option. Um, there are specific types of encounters, obviously where you're not required to physically touch somebody or examine closely something on their body or, or draw blood for a lab. Um, it's more optimal for those kinds of visits and it can potentially reduce costs for both the provider and the patients, um, obviously transportation, but many other costs as well. And so I can see that Alan Gambrell has just posted the 2020 sessions uh, there if you want to check them out uh, yourself. And that's one of the advantages of an online meeting is that everything's recorded. Next slide, please. And then uh, to end here, what are some of the requirements and challenges from telehealth? Again, largely from the Ryan White meetings. Um, some examples of requirements, obviously patients need a, a smartphone or a regular phone for uh, just a telephone visit, but a smartphone for a video session, or they need access to the internet. They need um, a desktop, for example, so they need software and equipment. Staff have to be trained at using this. And I know in my work talking to uh, clinic directors, often it was the younger staff who were more uh, familiar with using and adapting new technology quickly. Often MAs were, were pulled in to help with that. 
And finally, you need to sustain your clinic and your program, so you have to be able to secure reimbursement. And so there were some um, new waivers that were allowed to um, add for more flexibility in terms of what was billable. And then challenges, some examples from the sessions in terms of, of challenges. Obviously, it limits the physical exam and limits what you can do in terms of diagnostics. There can be less tech-savvy patients. And I know that um, in Los Angeles County, for example, well over 50% of HIV patients are over 50 and, and an increasing percent over 60 and 70. And so many of them um, may have a hard time accessing the internet or may not speak English as their first language to follow a lot of the instructions. And then in terms of time management, um, moving providers from telehealth um, visit to visit, like going from Zoom to Zoom meeting in our own days, um, sometimes can get bunched up. And you wanna be able to do telehealth the right way. And so that means if you're on video, still maintaining eye contact. If you're not on video, how do you maintain that human touch that you wanna maintain with your clients and patients? Next slide. So I'm gonna turn it over to Will now, who's gonna talk about what was in the jurisdictional plans. Thanks, Tom. So we reviewed all of the 47 uh, HRSA prioritized EAG jurisdictions. And we found that 11 of those jurisdictions focused on uh, tele some form of telehealth strategy. Uh, there were a total of 12 strategies proposed under pillar two. Um, it's worth noting here, we are also funded to assist jurisdictions in, in uh, Pillar 4 responding to clusters. And there were a few allusions to use of telehealth services in those plans as well. But usually they were um, described as a way to link people to treatment. So our focus today is going to be on the strategies that were proposed for getting people treated for HIV. So, so seven of the eligible metropolitan areas or EME, EME jurisdictions proposed telehealth and another four states proposed a telehealth strategy. I think it's also worth noting at this point that most of these plans were devised prior to COVID-19 and even if they were uh, updated, um, it was still fairly, uh, you know, uh, shortly into the pandemic. So um, there were a lot of jurisdictions that were already anticipating using telehealth before COVID-19, which is another reason that we wanted to focus on what happens post COVID because so many of um, the, the funded jurisdictions showed interest in developing telehealth. Uh, most proposed an expansion of current uh, telehealth services for HIV care or mental health services or substance uh, use disorder treatment or medical case management. And that would, uh, for the most part, be to support people living with HIV in rural areas, as well as those that had transportation issues or child care issues, or um, there were other limitations like fear of disclosure. Uh, another four discussed implementation of mobile apps for linkage and retention in care. And one, one jurisdiction talked about using subrecipient contracts to actually include electronic um, appointment reminders uh, in, in their telehealth strategy. Another jurisdiction proposed a cadre of, of telehealth adherence counselors. And um, that would be staff who use telehealth capabilities, including mobile apps like Positive Link to provide medication adherence support. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in, in sum, uh, I think that the, the, today's panel discussion is timely since so many jurisdictions are interested uh, in this. And we want to encourage folks to seize the opportunity presented by necessity. So COVID, as Tom mentioned, COVID-19 really pushed us forward a lot faster than we expected. And we had to develop and adapt quickly um, and pivot uh, the, uh, the, the delivery systems that we use for uh, healthcare so that we could stay connected with people. And I'm hoping that in our conversations and discussions today, we're going to identify some of those things that we wanna see sustained uh, as we move into the future. Back to you, Tom. Great, thank you. 
And I just wanted to also give a plug that in March, uh, we are planning to have a webinar on social media and apps and keeping people in care. So that's a little um, look for that in your inbox in the coming weeks. And we'll also be um, polling you at the end of today's webinar to see where you want uh, our next um, webinar around telehealth focus. So we can go to the next slide. So um, before I uh, introduce the panel, I want to remind everybody that you're part of this panel discussion. And so, you know, think about how you might um, ask questions that help you think about the type of PA uh, that you might uh, request that's related to telehealth in a post COVID-19 environment. Um, you can get the, the next slide for the list of today's panelists. And so um, I will be the moderator. As I said, I'm from the Department of Family Medicine at uh, UCLA School of Medicine. We have Dr. Leandro Mena from the University of Mississippi Medical Center, where he's also part of the Telehealth Center of Excellence. Dr. Mena, you want to wave so people can <laughs> see you and know who you are. Great. We have Dr. Derek Butler, um, who is both the HIV specialist at the THE clinic in South Los Angeles, and he's also also the chief medical officer. So he thinks about these things, not just from the perspective of the HIV clinic, but for the whole organization. So we'll be hearing from Dr. Butler today. Doc, we have Dr. Pierre Arti, who's the chief psychiatric officer for Housing Works, which is a federally, oh, Dr. Butler, you wanna wave? And so people will be hearing from you to know who you are. And uh, Dr. Pierre Arti is the chief psychiatric officer for Housing Works. Uh, he's waving to you there, which is a federally qualified health center in New York City. And then we have Dr. Susa Coffey, who's um, an HIV specialist, attending physician at the UCSF Division of HIV and San Francisco General Hospital. You want to wave Dr. Coffey so people know which box to find you. And then finally, you've already heard from him, we have Will Murphy, who's not just the, the director of CAPIN and a TA provider, but ran a federally qualified health center. And so a lot of you administrators out there, he, he knows your pain. And so uh, if you're an administrator, uh, if you are a case manager, we have lots of case managers, do um, go ahead and chime in with questions so that I can make sure to include them in the panel discussion. Um, but to get us started, next slide. Um, I'm gonna, uh, all the panelists, you can go ahead and unmute yourselves. And so, you know, we'll spend the first five minutes uh, just talking about what got us to where we are right now. And then we'll talk more about uh, the future and ideas for the future. So think back to, to March and April of 2020. Every single person who is participating today has their story, both professionally and personally, about you know, how they responded to COVID. So what were your biggest challenges and facilitators in, in your transitions that were related to telehealth when COVID started? And then what was your sort of um, mix in, of telehealth and in-person as of right now? And so if we can get, um, why don't we start with Dr. Mena, if you could sort of respond to these questions. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, Tom. Uh, so uh, as you mentioned earlier, you know, we have the benefit that UMC, the University of Mississippi Medical Center is one of uh, a, a, one of the few, you know, here's a form, the Center for Excellence for Telehealth. And uh, we had for now three years, you know, a number of projects, you know, a, and like many other uh, jurisdictions, right, we're looking to, you know, using telehealth to improve access, you know, to both prevention and treatment services. So we had a number of projects and pilots that were using telehealth right, to improve access, especially in rural areas, uh, or overcome some of the challenges, you know, of, uh, that some of our population had uh, in accessing, you know, services. Um, we also had already in place a a, a, um, technology to allow us uh, for patient reported, you know, data, you know, like a blood pressure and diabetes. So when COVID happened, you know, we in many ways were familiar with the technology. We had the capacity a, a, and we were testing, you know, in a pilot level, but our large, you know, health center was not necessarily, you know, at the same, you know, kind of a speed that many of us, you know, conducting the research and implementation work were. So when COVID happened, um, we were able to switch, you know, and make this technology available to our clinics. Uh, but this was done with so much uh, uh, urgency, right? Uh, making sure, and trying to make sure that people didn't have gaps in services, that we were able to um, navigate people to places where they can do their labs, that we we're able to communicate with them, make sure they have, you know, their, their, their access to their medications and refills, that there was very little attention in how this was gonna be effectively implemented. 
And while we had the capacity, right, to do video from the beginning, integrating to our medical record, you know, the default became the telephone, right? You know, many of our uh, providers, you know, were more comfortable with the telephone. Um, there was really no much guidance in terms of uh, the uh, uh, best practices, you know, have to do this. And then, you know, there was also from the consumer side, the reality that in order to do a video call, you know, you have to have a data plan. You know, uh, certainly in my iPad, if I'm on a conference call for one hour, I lose 100% of my charge. Uh, if you have a data plan at 30 minutes, you know, a conference call, video conference, uses almost one terabyte of data. So, so it was, you know, again, challenging, although we were in many ways very well prepared. The implementation was as uh, chaotic well, as it was in many other places who have never done this before. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And let me just choose one other. We'll have one other person share before we get to our panel discussion questions. How about Dr. Butler? Um, hello. And um, <clears throat> we unfortunately were the exact opposite. We were definitely not a center of excellence for telehealth when we started. Um, we are a, a, a mid sized uh, FQHC. Uh, at a federally qualified community health center in South Los Angeles, and we have a Ryan White funded HIV clinic. And when COVID hit uh, back last year, California, as you may remember, was one of the first states to lock down in Mar mid-March and pretty much caught most of us by surprise. So we basically had an electronic medical record, but had not tapped into any of its televideo services. Um, we we were um, we had to transition very quickly. Uh, immediately went to um, our first in, in multiple departments, scheduling patients to um, avoid unnecessary visits. Really dropped to probably seventy percent of visits being done by telephone. Which luckily the state allowed a waiver for our Medicaid patients to actually get telephone visits at the same reimbursement as a in-person visit. So we developed very rapidly within probably a week, a week and a half, um, a workflow that allowed our providers to, to schedule visits by telephone. Providers would call the patients um, and then set up ways that we could um, then uh, pretty protocols to allow them, if they needed to be seen, they would then schedule them in person. If they needed labs to try to send them to say a local uh, outside laboratory where they could just order the labs and they could go get them. We would get the results back on electronic record. And um, it, it, I, I'm very proud of clinic was able to integrate that with our IT department, billing, et cetera, and get our staff um, and templates actually, I forgot to mention, uh, templates set up in our system that allowed a telephone visit to now be done um, using a, a certain template in the EHR and which put in all the billing codes, put in kind of certain codes there together. It took us about two and a half weeks to get it down. We switched to about 70% telephone visits within probably that three weeks. Um, and, um, and, and, and now the pendulum has swung as the infection rates have swung back and forth. As I mentioned, those surges after the holidays, you know, we had started to decrease telephone visits and get more in-person, but then when the surge came again, went back to that and now slowly trickling back toward more in-person visits. And that happened in all departments around our system, including our HIV departments. Well, if you don't mind, Dr. Butler, I'm gonna to transition to the next slide and I'm gonna to, to stick with you if that's okay. And if, if you could just talk to the, the second issue, which is up here, which is technology. I know that you mentioned uh, in, in some of our pre-planning calls, uh, you know, issues with Zoom and you were able to sort of find a new technology that helped solve some of the problems. Yes, and the, we initially struggled with trying to jump right to video using Zoom or DoxyMe or some of these other formats. We found that that was extremely difficult for not only a workflow for our patients because it required um, initially, you know, having to switch from different formats, people needing to download an app, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if they can't, don't have capacity or the technology, like the device to do that, even our own system, uh, which we use, our electronic record required the patient to have a, a patient portal app downloaded, which we saw wasn't working either. And I mean, it really took us a few days to figure out that televideo wasn't going to work. We went really just focused on the phone. And that was huge, that technology that you're using. What we found as we've been working on this is that our system 
now allows a direct link where we can text the patient a link to their phone and it's a one touch uh, basically through that link through a text and they're open to a video. Once we saw that was available, that's what we kind of went for with our electronic record, just to make it as, as simple on the patient side as possible um, for them to actually get access through that. And um, I think we'll talk again about, do they have the bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera, but for the percentage of patients who do have some way, making that as simplified as possible, I think is, gonna, is key, besides just picking up a phone. Yeah, great, thank you for that. Is there anyone else who wants to chime in about technology? Any other comments about uh, a Pearl or our best practice you found? Well, then I'm um, going to trans- sure, go I, ahead. Yeah, I, I've, I've just found, found some commonalities. Um, unlike uh, Dr. Miller's um, program, ours here at Housing Works was much more similar. Our experiences were much more similar to what uh, Dr. Butler just described in terms of the very pressure of having this time limitation in which we had to really roll out uh, systems in order from everything from the templates as Dr. Butler mentioned to um, to the training of our staff along with patients and giving them access to the technology uh, in order to make this happen. So it was not an easy transition, but it was a pretty intense anxiety provoking type of transition when you think about uh, the patients that uh, I treat in terms of the psychiatric patients. Uh, but thankfully, uh, we went uh, through it. Um, but as I mentioned, um, it was not easy for both patients and staff. We had to get uh, individuals from other departments to come to help us out as far as choosing the appropriate apparatus uh, to uh, make that televisit happen. Um, pertaining to technology, we, we had trouble. We're still having issues with it in terms of the connection, connection problems, not being able to hear the person appropriately or, or, or seeing or losing the connection. And of course, this goes back to billing because we had to, uh, as we established a template, um, if you can't contact the person, you can't bill and we have to go back to the telephone uh, interaction, which is on, uh, here in New York, that was at a lower rate than a televisit. So we went through three evolutions of, um, mediums by which we would contact the individual. Now we are uh, experimenting with Doxy and we'll see how it goes, but it, it hasn't been easy. Um, and we're still, uh, we're, we're still at it, but uh, we did make the transition. And uh, I would say that the majority of the visits now are televisits because we're trying to decongest our waiting area since we have, we're trying to maintain this six feet social distancing. Uh, the majority both for medical along with psychiatric visits are televisits at this time. And Dr. Artie, you mentioned that um, it was difficult for both providers and patients. Can you share some of the patient perspectives on what was difficult for the transition to telehealth that you haven't already mentioned? Uh, Accessing the technology. Uh, And then even if they have the technology, then being trained upon the technology and understand that uh, many of the patients I treat have mental illnesses that may... um, uh, get in the way, I would say, of easily or facilitating the uh, the use of this type of technology. Uh, those were difficult things. So we had individuals from, as I mentioned, other departments to have the patients when they come in to train them, even as they're training our staff in terms of how to use this uh, newer technology. Um, it was, uh, as I said, not easy, but thankfully uh, we were making headway. We've made significant headway so that patients can, you know, just receive the indication that a televisit is at hand and they can just accept the phone call or accept the televisit and boom, um, we can have it. But it, uh, it, it certainly hasn't been um, easy. With psychiatric patients, there are some who uh, are very, very comfortable with uh, the idea of the television because they'd rather not just go out and expose themselves to harm uh, in any way, some who are dealing with anxiety disorders, but then there are some who really do need the social aspect of the, uh, of the interaction to, to be seen, to be heard. Um, if I can just elaborate a little bit more, it's kind of hard during the televisit if someone is opening up and telling you something very uh, intensely emotional and, and, and then you only have like 20 minutes <laughs> and, and, and you have to just kind of move on because someone is waiting in the, in the wings for the next televisit as opposed to somebody in your, um, in your uh, waiting area where you can just kind of step out and say, hey, could you give me a moment? I'm just running a little bit late. So there are challenges that do come with the televisits for psychiatry and I'm sure 
uh, for medicine. And I want to transition for a second to rapid art uh, via telehealth, but I did want to note before we go there that um, uh, Dr. Butler, someone in the chat did ask for the uh, electronic medical record system. Oh. That you use. Yeah, so we, we use what's called e ECW, eClinical Works is our electronic record. And they just recently came up with this direct linkage um, capacity. And we're, we're still working out the kinks on it. It's believe me, it's, but it's, it's, it really did help simplify the process. Dr. Butler, are you using the Hilo on ECW? It's, uh, well, it's, it's kind of, it's Hilo, but they've modified it now to be more direct. Hilo is originally based through their app, but now they have a system where you don't have to go through the Hilo app on the phone, but you can actually just direct sit for a visit, directly send a link to the visit in the video. Okay, we'll have to look into that because we also use the ECW yeah. and Hilo. So this sounds like it's uh, it's, it's it's a better technique. It's they, an evolution. And, so, and everybody you. out there, that's an example of real-time technical assistance that just occurred. So, <laughs> so, if you, so if you request, and, and Susa, I want to, uh, Dr. Coffey, I want to uh, turn to you because our first, uh, you were the lead expert on our first uh, webinar, which was on rapid art. And we didn't really talk a lot about telehealth and rapid art. So... Can you tell us at least in your program, what, do you, what, have, what have you been doing and where do you see it going? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, just everything that everyone has said so far is so interesting and I have so many reaction responses um, to it. But I'll just to focus on rapid uh, ART, I'll uh, back up one step and say that in uh, my clinic at San Francisco General Hospital, we serve a pretty vulnerable safety net um, hospital population. And our telehealth consists of one option primarily, and that's telephone. Um, we don't have computers that have uh, 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 cameras or, or microphones. And so it's not even possible for us. There is some um, uh, agreement whereby people can bring uh, their own laptops or UCSF owned laptops and, um, and use those, but most people choose not to do that. I, I share all the concerns that folks have mentioned already about the capacity for, um, for patient people to uh, accept or not accept or deal with um, tele, um, teleformat uh, visits. <clears throat> from a rapid uh, perspective, as from other perspectives, I think in our clinic, we've spent uh, a lot of months now sorting out what works well by telehealth and what doesn't work well by telehealth, what patients work well for telehealth and what patients don't work well with telehealth. Uh, and so our clinic has gone from about 50-50% uh, uh, tele and in-person in the early uh, weeks and months of the pandemic to now about 80% in person, 20% uh, remote. And I think we find that uh, remote visits, telephone visits are work better for follow-up than they do for new person appointments. New person appointments, especially in the rapid realm, I think are very complex. There's a lot of information that has to go both ways in that initial uh, visit. Plus we have to arrange for labs, plus we have to arrange for somehow them to get medications immediately, somehow make sure that the insurance is solidly in place and so on. And it, it turns out that it's possible and we do it when we have to, but we much prefer the person to come in at least for the initial visit. Um, there are other entities, uh, and I think of the state of Florida in particular, who have a lot of experience with doing rapid, including initial visits through uh, telehealth. Um, and they have systems set up that we don't at this point for getting access to medications very, very quickly and getting access to, to lab tests. Uh, we just haven't had those, um, don't have those systems in place at, at, at this time. Um, so I think I'll close there, uh, Tom, but have, we'll sure. jump in at other points sure. or comments. Feel free anyone to jump in at any point. And just mentioning labs, I don't know, Dr. Butler, if you've mentioned yet how you were able to use a, a, a lab provider like Quest to make it more convenient for folks. Yes, we, um, we were able to, so Quest lab, since we use a commercial lab, um, we were able to, and they have lab draw lab stations draw. around the city. So we were able to do orders. We could do orders electronically or fax them to the lab. And just tell the patient, go to this lab to get your blood drawn. And then since our system is integrated with Quest, we would get the results back through our EHR. And that worked for a lot of folks here. I mean, LA, as you know, is 
vast and I have patients living, you know, in different parts of the city. Um, and it really made it simple, and especially for us taking care of stable patients. Sometimes all you need is in th three or four months, you get their viral load, their CD4 count, you know, check their, you know, comp panel and, you know, you can tell them you're looking good, uh, do your STDs. I'll see you, you know, in three or four months. Um, so that did work out well for us. So a lot of people have been talking about, yeah, uh, well, Tom, if I can sure, go ahead, Dr. Minas. Experience, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the projects that we were funded by HERSA to our Center for Telehealth was trying to explore how to integrate telehealth in the linkage not to care of individuals newly diagnosed with HIV. I mean, you see that about 40% of people diagnosed with HIV are not, you know, have not been linked to care within 30 days of diagnosis. So one of the things that we've been doing, and we have, you know, several uh, counties in the Delta as our pilot counties, that we connect with a community health worker that gets called the moment someone is diagnosed with HIV. And with an IPA, I connect that with a provider via telehealth to that initial consultation. Just like Dr. Kofi said, we use actually some of our Ryan White in operant income. So we can offer the patient a right to come to Jackson, which is centrally located in the state of Mississippi. So that initial visit can be completed with an assessment of their needs uh, that will help you know, the individual to stay engaged in care and we can do the labs. The goal for us is to have the person diagnosed with HIV with medications in hand within seven days of diagnosis. Uh, and we've been doing that for the past three months. And so I hear a lot of um, you know, planning and, and, and best practices that happen just you know, almost in real time. People were responding to what was happening in real time. And now we kind of have uh, more of an opportunity to plan for telehealth and you know, use some of what we've learned for after telehealth. So if we're looking at uh, the first um, panel topic, assessing and planning for telehealth in the future, I'm gonna actually call on Will, who was a program administrator for um, an FQHC, and, uh, but now is a, a TA provider, you know, how can um, the jurisdictions that are out there that are thinking right now about, well, what are we doing? How are we planning for this? Um, how can they use TAPIN? Thanks, Tom. I really appreciate that. And I was reflecting on some of what the panel was talking about. And one thing that struck me was that <clears throat> the, uh, the planning for this sort of thing has, ha has been in the works for years. I consulted for uh, a small FQHC here in New York a couple of years ago on starting a teleprep program. Um, they were already really successful in rolling out PrEP to uh, their patient population. And they discovered they were doing a lot of phone refills and counseling and, and their patients really wanted to stay connected um, electronically. And part of that was because they connected with them originally electronically. They did a lot of recruiting through hookup sites and uh, they, they did a short form registration with people to introduce them to the center before they ever had a face-to-face -face visit. So I think our patients have been driving this prior to the pandemic. And what happened in the pandemic is we just took whatever we had already devised and just ramped it up really quickly. So this is really the perfect time to continue that planning and, and to think about the post COVID-19 environment and I appreciate the discussion about electronic health records. That was the uh, EHR that, that we were using when I was the executive director over here in, in uh, Midtown Manhattan of an FQHC. And a lot of FQHCs have chosen that electronic health record, but they, um, the point really is that you want your vendor to be thinking uh, your your H EHR vendor to be thinking about your future need and working on those adaptations. And the more vocal you are about the what the competitor is offering, but also you know what your patients are asking for, I think the faster those adaptations happen. Long story short, you don't have to do this alone. The planning for the post COVID environment is a technical assistance project that we can help you with. And you can reach out to us. We can work with you as a jurisdiction if you want us to. Um, we can involve uh, some work with your partners as well, your subcontractors or the, the treatment network that's delivering services to your patient population. 
And in terms of assessment and planning, we can provide a lot of practical and useful uh, needs assessment tools to help you to identify and meet your goals. So as we expand into telehealth and into 2022 and beyond, we're really going to be building on the experience of the, um, the folks like the people on the panel here uh, in making sure that our whole um, health system keeps moving forward with telehealth. And I think that's why we started with that case where they actually surveyed their patients and found that the patients were actually uh, not as looking forward to uh, video as much as maybe the providers were. Um, so I'm gonna invite the, the entire panel to just choose if there's any topic we haven't discussed yet uh, to go ahead and, and let me know that you wanna share a comment. I think Dr. Mena, you, you haven't shared something that I thought was interesting when you talked about um, your work with the Center of Excellence and when you're on video that you kind of like to use the entire upper half of your body so people can see your facial expressions and your hands. Do you have any other tips for, for people in terms of just using video or telephone? Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, there are a number of best practices. I think as Dr. Artin said, you know, one of the things that we learned very quickly is that connecting with patients, you know, via uh, telehealth, right? You know, certainly via phone is even more challenging than via video, right? It's not the same as in person. In person, you have the whole patient in front of you. You have, you know, all these you know, catch information from the other person that is not possible, you know, via the bidimensional, right, of uh, telehealth. So it's important, I think, in many ways, one, to anticipate that and to give, you know, what you do normally in 20, 30 minutes, you know, it will take one hour and a half, perhaps, in telehealth. You know, it's a lot easier when you already have a connection with the person. If you're meeting that person for the first time, if you do a one hour intake, plan to break it down two or three multiple days to give time for that. And, and I love the way, um, I think it's important to have a number of best practices, right? You know, making sure that again, as a healthcare professional, no matter where you are, you know, you're dressing professionally, it's important that you're looking directly to the camera, you know? So tell us since where the camera is, so you can, so people can see you looking at them. Um, uh, it's important, and I'm trying to do that as I'm, <laughs> as I'm saying this. Sometimes what I've done when I talk to patients, I put my picture, you know, on, underneath the, the light of the camera so I can look at me looking at the camera and see how the, how the patient can see me. And certainly, you know, when you take, you know, put your, you know, chair a few steps back to give a little bit more of a visual of your body, you know, you can use hand gestures, you know, to emphasize you know, things that you're taking, that you're talking about. Because it really creates, it tries to give more texture to the conversation to improve the connection with the patient. Be very alert, you know, to the, the advantage of high definition cameras is that we can see people's expressions, you know, so be very alert to the expressions of the patient and follow up, you know, when you see changes. Again, we try to be present as much as we can and that's what's important to avoid distractions. When we're having this kind of conversation, both from our side I'm from the uh, uh, patient side. Anybody else have any best practices that they just sort of discovered along the way? Maybe not from a center of excellence in telehealth. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> yeah, I would say- um, uh, Dr. Butler and then Dr. RT. Okay, yeah, I would just say for us, it's just, you know, like like Dr. Mena described, I'd say Dr. Coffey, Dr. RT. Certain patients, again, this works for them and certain it doesn't. Um, you know, we, we kind of figured out, obviously, initial visits, we kind of put them in, in person and then could follow up with a phone visit, et cetera, et cetera, following that. My very stable, well-known patients, we could easily just go straight to phone visits because we know them. They know us. There's no kind of gray area. When you're getting to know a patient, that in-person contact is really critical, as Dr. Artie and Dr. Coffey mentioned. I think in doctor, in, I know maybe more difficult for Dr. Mena with very rural patients, but they've got a system obviously in time to do that. But um, I think there's, you have to just, you can either set up a protocol where, you know, initial patients need to be seen or patients, for instance, I have some who are struggling and they need to, we need to bring them in. They're not, they're not biologically suppressed. Something's going on. I need my case managers to jump on them, be able to kind of pull them into this office and talk to them and then kind of stabilize them, send them on their way, 
then, okay, let's follow up with a phone visit. Oh, you're looking good. We'll go another phone visit. So being able to be flexible with, you know, and having thresholds for stay on, stay tele, tele, stay remote or come in. You know, I think you set those parameters up when you're, when you're planning your, your system and your workflow. I'm, I'm going to ask all the clinicians on the call, maybe just raise your hand if you, if you've had patients tell you, I like this and I kind of want to keep doing this <laughs> after COVID. Have you had patients who've said that directly to you? Looks like. Yes, and I've had patients say the opposite also. Yeah. Can I please come in? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sure people miss you too. They miss, they miss you and coming in. I think patients might want, want to have a choice, right? You know, sometimes they feel that telehealth will do it. You yes. know, sometimes they want to come in person. Yes. Yep. So I'll invite people, uh, including Will, to um, any of any remaining things you want to comment on. I'm going to invite the participants to put in the chat if there's a question or comment you want to make about these issues. I'd like to reflect on something very quickly, and that is some of the, um, the difficulties that uh, people have expressed about the technology itself. And, and I'm extrapolating from our experience, converting the training and technical assistance we do to 100% online during the pandemic. It doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen by magic either, right? So I think that this is a process of continually refining the way that you use the technology. And I think it's real, really beneficial um, to be able to train your staff on best practices, because as Dr. RT was, was mentioning, you know, there, there's a time factor here, right? You're adapting um, to a totally different environment, the electronic environment, but you're still restrained by scheduling and the fact that there's another patient. And, and so if everybody on the team is working together really well, including the patient, and I, and I say that very emphatically because uh, I remember when we first started using electronic health record texting and uh, all of the features of the EHR to stay connected with patients, there was great skepticism on the part of our staff that our older chronically ill patients would be able to manage that technology and adapt to it. And what we found was they were eager to do it. They often had more time to, to kind of deliberately learn features and they had an existing support network of people in their lives, like grandchildren or friends or um, et cetera, who could help them with that if they only knew right the right questions to ask, like, how do I do this? So bottom line, and sorry to go on so long, but it's, it's a process of continually refining how we use that technology. And as, as a somebody who, is really technically limited. Um, I think that it's so important to remember that, right? That we're, we're not done fixing the way that we do this. And, and that includes training our staff and adapting um, to what our patients are saying. Thanks. Dr. Poppy? I, I wanted to throw, thank you very much. I wanted to throw a couple more um, points for, for just sort of chewing over into the conversation. And that's that, um, we've all reflected that we were forced to make this big change uh, initially. Now it's very different. I mean, in the beginning, we were afraid for our staff, for our patients. We didn't want people coming in, you know, that sort of thing. Very, very different now where we're much more able to sort um, how much flow we want through the clinic, who can come, who, you know, who we prefer to stay out, who's who's stable and can stay out, as Dr. Butler was saying, um, for, uh, and do telehealth versus come in. Um, that's one point. Uh, so we're at a really good point to, to be able to sort where our telehealth services are and where we want them to be. The other is that there's very little data that I've seen anyway about, um, you know, our goals in HIV care are ART, ART adherence, viral suppression, retention and care over the long haul. There are very few data that are coming so far out of this horrible bunch of months we've just been through, um, but they're gonna be very 
uh, it's going to be very hard to sort out what amongst that is due to telehealth and what amongst that is due to pandemic and the effects of the pandemic itself separate from telehealth, right? And I think we need to be aware of that going forward. But our clinic, um, Ward 86, uh, published kind of early on our early uh, experience with uh, viral suppression in our uh, clinic. And in the early months of the pandemic, viral suppression really dropped off fair amount for people who are coming in and getting labs, despite the fact that adherence to patient visits as measured both by in-clinic and by phone visits was the same or higher. Uh, and so I think um, that was reflecting to us that some people, especially probably the most vulnerable, and we have some data that show this, really um, feel the loss potentially of clinic-based supports. It could be other supports, but it could be the physician or the provider visits as well. Uh, and maybe, and so telehealth may uh, not be sufficient for certain people. And, you know, it will be interesting to sort data as it comes down uh, into the future. But sort of that's a few things also, to chew over. I've also heard that um, there's concern that uh, there could be return to substance use in some patients that's harder yes. to evaluate uh, via telehealth. I don't know if anyone wants to comment about that or depression sometimes might be harder to evaluate. Dr. RT? Um, yes, but you know, I'd like to go back to how uh, Dr. Mina was giving us excellent instructions in terms of how to engage well <laughs> physically with the telehealth. And, and uh, as, as Dr. Mina, as you were discussing it, I just want to remind all of us as, um, as, as, as physicians, as providers in terms of self-care, I have had days when I've seen, you know, patient after patient after patient that are all scheduled. And, and at the end of the day, I'm thinking, my God, did I have a drink of water? You know, <laughs> did I go to the bathroom? Um, so we, you know, you, we have to really monitor ourselves as we're in this uh, world of telehealth that, uh, we need to provide some self-care or else we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll burn out. We, you know, there has to be time for uh, nourishment so that we can, you know, continue to move forward. And uh, Dr. Kofi, yes, I have had patients who say to me, well, who have said, doc, I miss you. <laughs> I'd like to come in because, you know, this is okay, but there's a certain, there's a different experience from having the individual there and, and, and you engaging in the, inter, in the interaction, even if we're within the industry standard of, let's say, uh, 20 minutes for follow-up visit. So uh, those, those are my comments about that. And, and, and Mr. Don, um, Dr. Donahue, I forgot your, your, your question that you asked specifically having to do with psychiatry. Oh, uh, just the concerns over depression, um, suicidal ideation or substance use, are they sometimes harder to, to navigate? Uh, yes, it, it's, it certainly uh, makes it a bit more challenging to navigate, especially having to do with substance use, because uh, there are uh, uh, requirements that the um, Department of Health, along with the Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, they've changed their name, I forget the new name, um, have having to do with individuals that, let's say, you prescribe specific restricted medications uh, for, and now there's no real, uh, unless it's really clinically, uh, you have a clinical indication. There's no, there's no need for people to come in to give you urine toxicology to, uh, to see exactly what's going on. So um, that we no longer um, have that in, in every case. Um, but I think it does make the interaction much more interesting because you have to you know, take the time to really get to know the person even more so without the um, shadow of the urine toxicology there. Um, so, but I think in some ways it can make uh, substance abuse uh, treatment a, a, a bit more challenging, but also let's say you're talking about uh, medication for opioid use disorders, um, it can make it a little bit more, uh, it can expedite treatment because the thresholds are lower as far as who can uh, be given these types of uh, medications, uh, it, it, it facilitates it, I think. So there are advantages to it. So it's a back and back and forth. So. Let me ask the last reflection item, uh, and I'm going to combine it with some uh, questions that are coming into the chat. So one person is asking if, you, if we could please repeat where in Florida they were doing successful rapid art telehealth. I don't know if, if we mentioned Florida. I don't know if you did, Dr. Coffey. Was it yeah, Florida? I mentioned uh, this, the Department of Health in Florida. So uh, Jeffrey Beal and, uh, is, is leading that, and they have 
Uh, I think they might have presented at, H at the uh, Ryan White conference. Um, I can try and get you some information, Tom, sure. too. Um, we'll, to pass that, we'll pass that along to touch. participants. Um, if everybody could reflect on your team, and so think of your team, whether it's navigators or um, uh, case managers, what do you think telehealth would be like for them? How do you manage that to keep the team meeting with patients? Um, I would just say, you know, I think all of us in HIV clinics know our teams are just as important as we are as clinicians, sometimes more important because we establish, I think I call it our oases for our patients, this place of refuge for some of our patients where they can, you know, you know, get help. They can talk about their HIV diagnosis freely. And that environment has always been useful, I think, for patients to come in. I mean, we can lose some of that doing uh, remote televisits, be by phone or video. I think uh, having our staff have this, you know, same uh, capability is extremely important to do these, do these type of interactions. And as I mentioned, you know, a, a way that patients who need to be seen can always access it. I mean, my pipe dream, this may be your uh, question you were gonna answer, but I think the, the, the what's gonna need to happen is I think a hybrid model of you know, inpatient visits, even televideo visits. And I hope if we can push politically to our payers to continue telephone visits for the people that that percentage who just cannot do a televisit by video. I think we need all three. Um, and I think like most of us have been operating with telephone. Some have doing both telephone and tele, uh, televideo. But there's always going to be a population where the phone is about as, as good as you're going to get. Um, and I think we need to have all three. And I think if all of us in our states can kind of make sure that is on the agenda when you, at least on the advocacy side, when you talk to your, your state payers, et cetera. And I think even HRSA needs to hear that, um, that that should be something that should be considered. Great. Thank you for that. And you, you got to shout out Dr. RT for reminding us about self-care from uh, people on the, um, in, in, the, in the chat. So uh, unless um, anybody has something, let's go to the next slide. And I just wanna give people um, you know, a last chance. I think we really covered this, but if there's any remaining tips um, that not just the panel, but people out there um, in the um, participant list uh, if there's some other tip that people want to share with us that we can share with everybody, our panelists, this is sort of our last chance to say, is there any remaining tips? I think we have lots well, of great ones. I think, you know, more than a tip, you know, I just want to bring attention to that, that perhaps the reason why, you know, telehealth was so quickly adopted because of COVID was, you know, a very, you know, Dr. Butler mentioned that, right? Medicare, the pay or CMS made it possible. You know, so I think that it's really important. I mean, telehealth is an amazing tool that has the potential to serve very well a subset of our patients increasing access. So it's very important for all of us, you know, to advocate, you know, to CMS, to HRSA, to make sure that the same degree of, you know, that, that, com that, that the appropriate compensation, right, is provided for these services. I think that would be probably the number one determinant whether telehealth has a future, right, in, in, with us in, in healthcare, in HIV care or not. Great. If we could go to the next slide. So um, if you don't mind, Will, I, I'd like to go do the last polling question before we do Q&A in case some people have to leave. So if we can go to the next slide and do the sure. last polling question. So when you think about um, uh, uh, what would be your number one choice for a future and the HIV epidemic telehealth related webinar, would it be using apps to improve health outcomes? Would it be delivering team-based uh, telehealth care? Would it be uh, delivering behavioral health via telehealth? Would it be on, uh, as Will was discussing, it could be on you know, a needs assessment or how do you obtain patient input and feedback to improve telehealth? Would it be those billing and reimbursement issues that Dr. Mena left with in terms of thinking about advocating for policy, but you might you know, uh, wanna see a webinar on that specifically, or would it be some other uh, telehealth related uh, need that we could put into a webinar for our next telehealth related webinar? So go ahead and vote. And then if you choose other, go ahead and put in chat. 
And we'll go ahead and, and close that and look and see what people were thinking. Okay, great. So it looks like number one is obtaining feedback. So that's great. I think that we would very much welcome um, to work with you uh, and, and doing a needs assessment um, uh, for your patients, because that's really a critical driver, as you've heard from everybody. Then delivering behavioral health via telehealth. I'm really happy to see that that's the second most popular. And so we can help you think through that and we can have a webinar on it as well. And then using apps uh, came in third. And so we will have a social media webinar and we can sort of talk about telehealth on that as well. And I'm looking to see, I don't see anything else in the chat. Um, yes, we will be recording. We are recording today. Um, and thank you for saying that you want this valuable information. So we will make that available to you. And then if we could go back to Q and A. So any questions from the audience or comments? You know, I, I just had a comment too, because I'm thinking, you know, I, you know, right now about 70% of the country is like snowed in, in the midst of snowstorms, even in Mississippi, Dr. Maina, I saw the news. Um, but think about the fact that using this technology now, normally half your clinic wouldn't show up because it's a snowstorm. You could actually still be seeing your patients right now, you know, with this, you know, so I think it's again, as an asset going forward, I don't see how we can back off from, you know, televisits as part of our, 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 our you know, our, our programming, you know, in our, in our programs, because this really, I mean, besides COVID jumping us to this, now we see the practicality of how this can be useful going forward. You know, um, luckily here in LA, we don't, it's not snowing here. So, so <laughs> but, uh, you know, but I, I saw what's going on, especially places not used to this. You know, I, mean, I saw Texas is basically shut down, you know. Um, so just think what that's doing to your Ryan White patients who need to be, we need to contact, so. I, I wanna point out that we've been posting resources throughout, but again, don't do it alone. I see Dr. Maina just posted the um, Infectious Disease Society along with HAVMA um, published uh, this brief article on some of those policy issues. Uh, it was really good article. I would encourage people to read that. Any other comments or questions? You you had um, mentioned something about patients with uh, depressive disorders. And I think that this is wonderful for those individuals who may not have the uh, motivation or even the, the, the physical strength or, or to just step out and go through. I mean, in New York, you know, you have to take the bus and the train and, 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 you know, we have a whole subway system and, and, and so, but for those who may not have the strength to do that, um, this can provide access to care uh, from an individual's home. Um, certainly there are issues with that in terms of confidentiality, in terms of privacy, but it's, it's, it's a venue by which there is access to care. So I would agree with what Dr. Butler uh, said for many individuals. I mean, there's, there's no going back. Um, this, this is here to stay. And I think you mentioned uh, confidentiality and, and privacy. And I think a lot of that would be good things to ask patients about as well. You exactly. Know, what concerns they have. I know that from providers in Los Angeles and one group I'm a part of, they were mentioning that the first thing they had to make sure there was the patient wasn't driving, you know, while they were doing their telehealth visit. And so things that you didn't necessarily think about. Um, so Will, do you want to take us uh, on the next step? Maybe this. Absolutely. Really want to reiterate, you don't have to do this alone. Everything that we've talked about today uh, in, in this panel discussion could be a topic for TA. And <clears throat> overall, the topic of telehealth uh, really lends itself to some of the ways that we will be delivering TA, including peer learning, peer sharing networks, uh, and direct TA in your, your jurisdiction. jurisdiction. So just want to re-emphasize that you don't need to do it alone, that we've got a, um, a, an, you know, a huge, uh, huge, we, we have an expansive uh, faculty of experts who can help you with this. And Will, I was also going to mention that um, we have a lot of case managers on. And so you know, that could be, for example, a future webinar topic, you know, case management via telehealth. And we'll mm -hmm. have that in the future. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, to the panelists and participants out there. We appreciate it.